Hi, and it's Paul Tyler, and welcome to another edition of our Innovation Live. Um, this is Tuesday at noon. Yeah, Laura. I think it's Tuesday. Yeah, it's great to be back uh, today with us. We have Anaya Nelson and Karia Nadu from Amatry. So I'd like to start off by saying thank you for joining us today. And why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Carrie Ann, let's start with you. Tell us who you are and what you do. Great. Well, pleasure to be back uh, in the Nassau Re family and broadcasting live this time. This is very exciting to be reaching folks. My name is Carrie Ann Nadeau. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Amatry. Uh, Ometry is a risk technology company and we're measuring road safety. So what that means is trying to predict where traffic crashes are likely to happen. Very important time to be doing that amid COVID-19 and I think we'll have a lot to talk about today. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm joined by Linnea Nelson, who is our head of business development uh, and a friend of the state of Connecticut, I'm sure, uh, to a lot of those tuning in. Linnea, do you want to take it next? Yes. Um, hello, Linnea Nelson here, Head of Business Development at Ometry. Um, oh, shoot. It, Sorry, go, keep going. Sorry. Okay, keep saying, going. Oh, no, that was comments. fun. I didn't know if there was anything on my end. Um, no. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here and be with friends and um, familiar faces and talk about how we can get these roads safer, especially not especially, but in Connecticut specifically. Yeah. No, and I want to say welcome back. We had uh, two really good podcasts with both of you. And uh, I know you two go way back. Both of you have Hartford roots. Uh, Karen, they do. You're, you're actually from the Hartford area originally. Your parents live here, correct? Yeah, my parents live in downtown Hartford. Um, so I am in Hartford quite frequently uh, visiting them, probably not as much as they would prefer, you know, as parents. But um, I'm born and bred, born and bred in in Cromwell, Connecticut, just south. So something's in the insurance water, you know, something's in the water uh, in Connecticut that brings us back to insurance. And Linnea and I have known each other for 20 years. So she makes a great uh, right hand wing woman uh, when we're building Ometry because we really go way back. We know all the secrets from when we were 13 years old, what we both were like. Uh, we actually both attended Mercy High School in Middletown together. And Linnea is from Connecticut as well. Linnea, you grew up in, was it Naugatuck, I wanna say? No. In Chester, Connecticut. Oh, okay. Down Route 9, yep. Yeah, well, you know, and we want, we're obviously gonna get into some really interesting uh, conversations about data, but I, I will tell you when I, we. Uh, you're both, you know, Karen, you were obviously running your startup. Linnea, you were on another venture. It, it, when I talked to both of you, I thought, okay, this somehow you two are going to get together. Um, uh, it, it's got to be easier working in a startup when you've got so much history in terms of communications, trust, knowledge. Um, Karen, how, do, how does it feel to have somebody you've known so closely work on something that's so close to your heart here? Yeah, you know, a lot of startups are like that. There's many stories of founders who've known each other for 20 plus years that come together on a venture. And I'll say it manifests for our company as well that you share a common understanding and a common core of values. Um, I definitely want to punt it over to Linnea because, you know, I'm the boss talking on her behalf. So she probably has something to say about this. But I think Linnea, one of the things we are so tied closely on is our social mission and our intent in building a company that leaves the world better off uh, than where it began because we were here um, and our uh, interest in bringing really you know technical skills I, you know, I'm a data scientist and city planner by trade so I come from a very specific expertise um, bringing that into insurance to hopefully influence the way that the business is done with new sort of modern different approaches that, um, again, hopefully evolve the industry in a really positive and meaningful direction forward. Well, Nan, I, I imagine you agree, but I don't want to speak for you. <laughs> yeah. I do agree. And Paul, it's funny, it was uh, just over the weekend, you know, Carrie Ann sent me a really nice message, um, you know, just talking about uh, just that and thanking me for, you know, being just as, um, you know, it, it's my company too, I feel like. And it's, you know, it's not just because Carrie Ann is my dear friend, but it's something I truly believe in. Um, and I think we are revolutionizing 
in a way that will ultimately save lives and also improve lives, not just save them, um, but it will improve quality of life and, um, you know, take some stress and weight off of uh, people's shoulders in the insurance world and maybe even give, uh, you know, the insurance industry, um, you know, a better name, a better face uh, or an improved one at least. So yeah, yeah it's something I, I feel very passionately about. No, this, 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 this is good. Uh, you, you two obviously work really well. Now, now Karen, last time, so we had a, a fascinating discussion about what your company did last time. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I think about back then and now, it's like, okay, what was really new and like opening doors to new possibilities of pricing and products. Now, you sh I think your data is going to be a, an, an absolute necessity for a lot of companies. Now, you're not going to mm -hmm. see this, but I'll throw it for the people watching this on LinkedIn. I'm going to pop up your uh, your uh, web page uh, for a second, and it's ometry.com, right? Road safety measurements trusted by insurers. Know where it's unsafe to drive with location-specific risk sources. So tell us, what does your company mm -hmm. do? Yeah, um, the high level elevator speech about what we do is we bring data together and we leverage um, drivers who are using either telematics devices or ELD devices to know where they are and we connect them spatially. So we wanna understand questions like where you drive, is it safe? Are there accidents happening on the roads that you drive all the time? Um, are you behaving really poorly on those roads? Are you speeding in the worst possible areas? Um, by answering those questions, I think we're filling out really the, the last missing category of risk that insurance has had a hard time measuring before. So we've done a really good job measuring the driver and their behaviors and who they are and their financial credit history. We've done an okay job measuring, um, you know, things like the vehicle performance or the types of cars that we're driving. But what we've missed is probably the most intuitive piece. Where are you? Are you on unsafe roads? Are you more exposed than others? And these sort of devices being more ubiquitous in cars. And with COVID-19, we're seeing trends and acceleration of using these sorts of devices in vehicles. We can talk about why that is, but we think it's a growing trend and we're right in the way, right in the right moment at the right time to say, hey, this thing we couldn't measure before, this important category of risk is an important, is going to be even more important going forward. It's going to be vital to help manage risk today. We don't understand why during COVID vehicle miles traveled are going down, crashes overall going down, but fatal crash rates are spiking. Why? Well, none of the data that we collect today about the drivers or how much they drive or how they behave really explains any of those trends or that trend of fatal crash rates. Um, where we think it's really important is maybe they're speeding on really dangerous roads now where they can get up to speed, where they can go too fast uh, for the nature of that road. And we think we're bringing the data to bear to, to really inform risk measurement in a very modern way and in the moment, a very important way as well. Yeah, so let, let, let's sort of stick there with with habits and like what this is doing to the insurance and and how, you know we talked about I think we talked about UBI or, or usage based insurance. I mean there are a couple of different UBIs out there, and actually this this is not you know we can go to Andrew Yang. I, we uh, had had a really interesting discussion with him on another podcast and and uh, UBI a few months ago, um, but you know my, my insurance company usage based what no. Okay, I call them up on the phone. Guess what? Now they're giving everybody usage-based in, uh, insurance. I mean, sort of. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's with a with a broad stroke. Has this? Do you, do you see in your conversations attitudes towards if insurers looking at this market, saying, "Okay, wait, maybe we should uh, charge based on on more than just my credit history." Yeah. So I think there's still a lot of doubt about usage-based insurance, both from the insurers and from the consumers. So let's start with the doubt on the insurance side, right? We haven't had enough experience writing usage-based insurance policies to see some of the promise loss lift manifest. We just don't have enough drivers on the road to prove anything from an actuarial perspective. 
And I think a lot of folks who are fighting the good fight on the front lines of UBI for the future benefits that will accrue from gathering more data that usage-based insurance allows us to do, um, feeling pressure internally that the performance hasn't manifest to the magnitude that um, would be expected by stakeholders and shareholders of insurance carriers. So I feel that what that means is we need to focus with insurance carriers on acquiring and retaining customers right now so that we can get to a place in the future that actuarial models have enough information, have enough data to prove the case. So we need to be helping them acquire and retain customers today. We think giving customers information about where it's safe to drive is a great strategy to do that. Instead of being big brother and saying, hey, we're gonna watch if you speed and maybe give you a discount, we're saying, hey, we're gonna take care of you and your family and make sure you get home safe. Here's the information you need to do that. Changing the narrative, just that slight difference, I think really changes the relationship between the consumer and the insurance carrier and encourages positive behaviors instead of just um, you know, penalizing negative behaviors. Now, we also hear it on the consumer side, right? There's still doubt about these devices in my vehicle. I personally have a little bit of concern as well that my insurance carrier is going to be able to track me and big brother me. And there's that fear and a very legitimate fear as well. We see lawsuits currently against Google um, that is tracking folks without their permission uh, popping up. So it is a very legitimate concern and one we should also focus on and address in our strategy. So what we talk about with consumers and, and how we address that doubt is actually by getting rid of this need to exchange PII altogether, personally identifiable information. I am willing to share my location if I get some benefit. So I'm willing to share just this information about where I go in order to get a route from Google Maps or to tag a photo on Instagram. I have about seven or eight apps on my phone right now that I give away location information to for some benefit. We need to make that argument to consumers. I don't need to know, you know, the name of your firstborn child, your financial credit history, all of this drama that legitimately makes you fear me having that data. I just want this thing that you give away to many other companies as well. I want to know where you are. With that where you are information, you're able to add Ometry's data about contextualizing the nature of how dangerous is that location and better rate to, again, build this case internally for the actuaries, for the stakeholders and shareholders within a large insurance carrier, that this is working. It's a real shift of mindset for both the insurer and the consumer, but the broader overall trend is trending in that direction. People don't wanna pay for insurance that they're not using. They're demanding usage-based insurance during COVID. They feel that if my car is parked in the driveway, I shouldn't have to pay as much. I'm only having it insured if a tree falls on it or if hail falls on it, if I'm not driving it. And I think there's a new uh, swath of insure techs that are coming out that while consumers are home shopping online for maybe better insurance policies or more affordable rates are swooping in and stealing those customers from the traditional carriers that aren't paying attention. And then third, you see auto manufacturers stepping into the space, putting the devices directly into the vehicles and intermediating the insurance carrier's ability to gather this data directly from their own customers. So all three of these things together would suggest that the moment is ripe for UBI and for some of the traditional insurance carriers to wake up to the opportunity. Only 5% of the market is saturated with UBI today which means to the bright folks out there, 95% of the market is up for the taking. Uh, I think this is fascinating. By the way, Laura, we, we got some of our friends on here. So uh, Michael Davis has, has done a shout out. Uh, awesome. uh, Bobby at Ben Akiva, hey, says, uh, uh, send some Here's, virtual yeah. high fives. Matt Elon Smith from South Africa is is watching and is <laughs> says thinks you're doing some great things. Um, and uh, we've actually got somebody from Iran. Uh, actually, Alreza Jahadi. Jahadi, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Welcome. And if you have questions or want to join in the discussion, uh, 
pop in Laura and I'll uh, or, or uh, I will, will uh, pop your questions in here. Let's just I'm going to double click a little bit since we're all living in this virtual world. On a, okay, ownership of data, right? I've seen a lot of stuff out there. Like I should be able to own my data, control it, be in charge of it. Um, Carrie Ann, just we had a really you got in in, in a, a really interesting LinkedIn discussion I threw out at the start of this crisis, which was. Wait a second, how good a job are we doing social distancing? Because people don't realize, wh how are you getting that? Why will Google tell me that it's going to take me longer to go this route than another? It's because these telephone companies are selling our data right now to these aggregators who track us for traffic. Okay, Now, we benefit because we've saved gas, saved time, done a lot of things. There's good stuff. Well, are people hanging out together uh, during a, 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 a point of time? Are they going away? Now, should I personally have the right to turn my data off so that all of you don't know your chances of getting infected from all the stuff I've been doing? Carrie, and where, where did, how, do, how does this fit? Yeah, I think there is a bigger conversation. You know, you hearken to Andrew Yang, and he is, is notable for uh, bringing this question to the national stage as well. Um, I think there is a bigger conversation about what sort of rights the consumer should have for companies being able to monetize their data. If I'm able to build a billion dollar business and ometry off of the backs of other people's personally identifiable information, should I reward my stakeholders and my shareholders in that as part of that process? Um, I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I will say that we've established our company and my cat is interrupting. Um, to <laughs> actually not require personally identifiable information. Linnea, maybe you want to jump in while I get this pesky cat off no, of the- Bring the cat in. Bring the cat into the show. I will, absolutely. But our maybe you want to- will, our, our ratings will go way up with a cat on here. Oh, for sure. For sure. I had my cousin used to post pictures of their kids and one day as they posted a, a picture of their cat and they were like, the most likes I got was with the cat. Um, for sure, I'll go grab him. He's, okay, get, he's yeah, get him. So maybe talk, yeah, yeah. Linnea. Yeah, and, uh, and Laura, <laughs> well, Linnea you know. can jump in here and definitely talk about how we build relationships with DOTs because we can mm -hmm. circumvent actually abusing people's personal data just by actually leveraging some public records that are already being collected and are available. Okay, Linnea, tell us about that. Yeah, and I think, you know, up until this point, we are, um, you know, we're using things like uh, people's credit scores, et cetera, which I think there is, there's a place for that, but I think it's not, you know, the end all be all. And I think, um, you know, if we can create these sort of uh, private public partnerships that I know, you know, you guys know well, um, how important those relationships are. And I think if we can develop these relationships with DOTs or with um, research groups um, at state universities, um, you know, we can really bring information about to the public that will benefit everyone. There's, it's just a win-win-win across the board in terms of making the roads safer and having um, kind of putting more agency and autonomy into the driver um, or the, you know, fleet management, um, you know, risk manager um, and giving them more autonomy over um, even their policies or their pricing, et cetera. So I think um, those relationships, uh, you know, we don't even really know how beneficial they could be, but I think, um, you know, that's something we're trying to establish now in Connecticut with UConn and the DOT is one of the first that we're really, um, we've, I think, Carrie Ann, have we, we have um, the API completed integration mm -hmm. um, and we get updates nightly, correct, on this regularly. I'm not sure if it's nightly exactly, yeah. but we're able to sort of back channel directly from the Department of Transportation Systems into right. a public resource that mm -hmm. organizes the data for consumption for the broad public. So for drivers out there who want to know where in Connecticut is it safe for me to drive right now? Um, and at, mm -hmm. we're able to aggregate that by county or insurance territory 
for carriers who are looking to stay on top of how trends are changing and whether or not they need to be adjusting rates, thinking about being more strategic about uh, supplying discounts and identifying fraud. We all know fraud is increasing during these times. Do we have crashes in areas where we're not seeing crashes being reported to the DOT, but they're showing up on our doorstep? There's a lot of questions that folks can be using this very public resource for if an organization like Ometry is in the middle, helping to organize it and transmit it in a way that's useful um, and that don't require PII, that don't require us to go back to the consumer and say, hey, can I invade your privacy and build a billion dollar business on top of your back without giving you any benefit at all? We're saying, hey, the Department of Transportation has all the data we need to be able to help you drive safer. I mean, woman. Are there so, trade offs? Yeah. You talk about, you know, the personal, you know, PII and what that data gives you, and then it's the DOT data. Are there, are there trade offs in the data sources? I mean, I don't know why someone wouldn't find this to be a positive thing. Um, on, on many levels, and I even mentioned it's a win-win-win. So is it more of a mindset that we're up against? Like, I don't, from a consumer standpoint, yeah. love that. Well, I, and I'll, I'll speak from the insurer standpoint to begin with. Um, I think, you know, we've been training insurance carriers or tr- training actuaries, training underwriters to collect data about people to be able to rate people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the data we've had, right? It's what we had access to. When we got access to credit score, we started saying maybe we should consider this as part of the rating model because we can connect that to an individual and augment what we know from their own self-reporting, from their own filling out of the 10-page application for auto insurance, from the data we can collect from other pooled resources about whether that car had been in a crash before. You know, you're trying to compile a view of how good is this risk and what sort of pool should I create, right? Um, But we never really thought about geography as part of that conversation. So we got so focused on adding one more thing of data and buying one more bit of data to understand me personally. And the consequence is twofold. One, we didn't think about external data and contextualizing where you are and that you may be just this specific anomaly on a map. You live in a very different place or you go in a very different place. Um, but two, we ended up what's called overfitting in statistics. So we, we fit a model, we fit a, a risk assessment for you that's so specific to you that it's hard to extrapolate anything and make decisions about people that we might now want to additionally ensure. So what that means is every new bit of data that we get about you is worth less and less and less and less to us which we can see, right? Data sources today cost a penny or a nickel per record because no one adds enough value if you just think about the model on the unit of the person. Instead, we need to think much, 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 like infinitely bigger. Like I can't put enough muches there because a unit of one with 20 columns is very different than a unit of one and two million records, like two million rows, right? Right. If we can connect more data around somebody, we got the universe to measure around somebody, but we're running out of things to add to them personally. So it's, it's a very big shift in the actuarial science, you know, the fundamentals of actuarial science that we're trying to perpetuate. But I will say actuaries are like, this makes a lot of sense. And they're super excited about finding more risk to measure, right? They're, this is blowing people's minds that, in fact, we can connect things spatially. We can know, am I exposed based on where I start my business or where I drive or where I go? And the market is increasingly saturated with the devices I need to do that measurement. So we should be doubling down, tripling down on UBI because it's going to expand infinitely the amount of risk we can measure. So I think it's it's just not been part of the conversation before Ometry and why people are so excited and why people think it's such a big opportunity is because it is and because it's intuitive. I'm not creating a 3D box and trying to see it from the underside. I mean, how many of us have seen these awful startup pitch, you know, where you just don't even understand what it is they're doing. They're making it intentionally obtuse and complicated to understand. 
we're saying, hey, you know that bad road that you know in your neighborhood? We can measure that now. We can add that to our assessment of our risk. We can know if you're on exit 13 or Route 9 that has a stop sign onto an on-ramp with a stoplight 100 yards up the way and a ton of high school students from Mercy and Xavier uh, entering the highway at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with very little training about how to navigate such a complex uh, intersection. Right? We know that that's a bad road. Let's start using that information. And I think people are excited about that. People see the opportunity. Now, it can be hard to integrate. It can be hard to change such a fundamental of the way we thought about risk before, but it's the right thing to do. We may be early. Those that work with us may be early, but they're not wrong. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a pricing actuary for, I don't know, a, a commercial vehicles or, a, or for personal autos. Carry, so we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. People have sort of changed yeah. their behaviors. Will it last? You know, ordering more more of these tr big trucks coming through neighborhoods. Can, can I actually confidently price my product based on historical data? That's Next a good year, question. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have the crystal ball to know that answer, but my let's talk about what's happening now and why it's so different and why we have to ask this question of how are we going to model this going forward. So you mentioned it sort of tangentially. What's going on right now? Nobody's on the roads. So vehicle miles traveled down 50 to 75 percent. Crash rates, depending on the state, down 20 to 40 percent. The crash, fatal crash rate is spiking. So of the crashes that are happening, they're more likely to be fatal now more than ever. Well, then you ask why that? Well, a few things. Speed, uh, we're spe seeing dramatic increases in speed camera issued tickets up 57% in April and March in New York City. So folks that couldn't go very fast before are now going very fast. We see a dramatic increase in the number of commercial vehicles as a proportion of vehicles on the road as well. A lot more at-home delivery. So companies that maybe didn't have a commercial vehicle as part of their fleet before, your local florist, your local supermarket, your local, I don't even know, barbershop even, like coming to homes to be able to deliver services, deliver food, and they're driving commercial vehicles. Um, there's obviously a lot more Amazon type delivery vehicles out there as well. So increase in the number of drivers who are showing up to a subcontractor with a smile and a driver's license and saying like, I'm ready to drive a uh, Mercedes Sprinter van with no backup camera, um, you know, big van that I've never been able to drive before, never had any experience driving before. So all of these things come together, the sort of inexperience of folks on the road, the increase in commercial vehicles out there, the speed increases are all resulting really in this outcome of more fatal crashes. So then the question becomes, can we measure these dynamics to be able to predict the future? Right now we can measure speed if we have UBI. Right now we can measure commercial auto if our customers tell us that they're using their vehicles commercially. Um, but we can't capture you know, who is the most exposed if we sit on the more traditional means of writing insurance, which says show up every year, tell us a little bit of information about yourself uh, and we'll rate you annually. So I think part of the transition to UBI, part of the transition to dynamic pricing is we're, we're needing to measure some of these dynamics on a shorter time frame, um, and we're needing the devices in the vehicles to be able to measure these things. Um, so I think, you know, could we use today's measures forward? Yes, but it's going to require this sort of transition technically and mentally, right? We're going to have to shift from the old way of doing things to a more modern way of doing things. Um, and that's our moment right? That's Amitri's moment. We're in the right place at the right time. We're the fly in the room with a bunch of elephants saying, hey, look at us. We've got an answer for this problem, which is take what you already have working, make it better, track it regularly, currently, 
We just um, even launched a website called crashometry.com, keeps track of how things are changing during COVID on a state by state basis. And then we've launched for a select number of customers a county and territory level analysis as well. So you can adjust rates, you can look at how your business may be more exposed um, during this time, what's going on right now. You can look for fraud and long-term, you can actually use the data to be able to model forward. Otherwise, you're going to have to throw this year out of the data pool and, and pray that things return to what was normal before COVID without an assumption that that will ever be the truth again. We may be in a just a transition, a very dramatic, a very volatile transition, but into a new normal that you know every carrier will struggle predicting if they don't make that transition now. Okay, so you sold me. Last hard, this is a hard one, which for me at least is, is okay, data equals power. Okay, in the famous of, words sure. of one famous philosopher, okay, with great power comes great responsibility. Great. Now, I, my perception could be wrong. Okay. Now, I, I live in Westchester County. If I'm going to drive to Midtown Manhattan, I'm not doing this now. Okay. Uh, for a long time, the quickest route was right through the Bronx. Okay. It was it was on on the, uh, you know, the, there's a, a freeway that, are, that goes right through the Bronx into Mid, Midtown Manhattan. All of a sudden, about three years ago, every single service starts routing me all the way over through Yonkers and back. Now, crime data okay look that bad road you just flagged maybe that bad road is because that's a poorer community they don't get the the roads aren't taken care of like other roads so now all the traffic goes away so now you just killed us for the businesses right they're not getting the gas stations aren't getting busy sure. how, how, do, how do you how do you filter for great information mm -hmm. but why and what's the root cause and how do you not perpetuate what's what's you know fundamental problems in a in a community yeah, I'm going to uh, quote a, a great insurance, a wise insurance person, Warren Buffett, and he said, risk is just the absence of measurement. If you don't know, you don't know, right? Risk comes from not being able to measure all of those things. So the more measures that we can add, the better we can optimize for the way that we want to navigate the world. If I'm a commercial fleet, Right now, I only have the choice to navigate for safe or for speed, gas mileage, right hand turns, you know, the number of hours I want a vehicle on the road. And I've got a deadline that says you better get that truckload of goods to the uh, warehousing facility at this time and don't be late. That's what they have right now. So they don't have a view. They don't have a measurement even of are the roads I'm taking going to expose me disproportionately mm -hmm. to risk? Am I likely to be in a crash on the route to that destination? Am I likely to sit in traffic because maybe I didn't crash, but it's likely that a crash might happen on those roads and have me sitting waiting to get, you know, missing an on-time delivery. So there's other things we want to know, right? As a fleet risk manager, I want to know, am I making sure that the person I employ is getting there safely? Am I making sure that my goods get there on time? Am I optimizing for all of the, the risks that I want to avoid? And so the only way to get there, the only way to be able to consider what are the downstream effects, what are the side effects, is to be able to measure those things. So you're making the case for me, Paul. You're saying, look, like there's consequence to not knowing and making a choice. Right. We can know more. We can make better decisions and minimize our risk exposure in the process. Oh, hey, this has been great, Laura. What other what other questions should we cover? You know, uh, where do I sign up? No, <laughs> no great question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a great. It, it has been a great conversation. And um, you know, we had a question come in, and, and I don't know if you can give a, a thirty second answer to it because I'm sure it's not a clear cut thing. But Michael Davis had asked. Um, essentially, how do you take the information received by the DOT and, and how do you look at it in terms of data quality and, the, and what's been given to you? Great question. So any good uh, you know, data analyst, data uh, scientist, statistician, actuary, that should be everyone's first question is what is the quality of the data that comes in? Because the quality of the data comes, the coming in dictates the quality of the data coming out. 
So what we aim to do is gather as much information as we can that we think is important to crash risk. We've worked directly with departments of transportation, fire and emergency response, police departments to be able to inform our models. So our approach is not throw everything into the cauldron, mix it around and see what sort of magic it creates. Our approach is very thoughtful about building a recipe that predicts and anticipates crashes. So we do things like exclude data that we don't think are relevant that we have and include data that um, our uh, team has researched might be important. So that leads to things like cars parked in the right hand side in our models. Interesting, you know, if we showed up, we wouldn't have necessarily put it into our models, but biking advocates at the Department of Transportation told us, look, if a car is parked on the right hand side, we get calls about people getting doored on their bicycles. Turns out people sideswipe cars parked on the right hand side. So it's really important to ask those questions to start before we started building our approach and thinking we were some wise sage that knew everything. We asked those hard questions. Once we start building our models, um, it's different. We do a state model on a, we do models on a state by state basis. And we have a very rigorous methodology to evaluate the quality of the data that we receive. Sometimes it's absolute garbage. Uh, and we need to sift through that sort of thing. Uh, we need to be making choices and being transparent with our customers about how we've changed the data or supplemented the data to understand, you know, what sort of choices we made in our process. That said, the amount of data that we're getting, if there is a small margin of error and we are capturing 20 to 40,000 crashes every month in the state of Texas, the quantity of data and a small margin of bad quality, that quantity is so big, it's bigger than any individual carrier could capture themselves, right? Think about me, my individual carrier has maybe a thousand claims in the state of Texas a month. I, that might be generous even. And we're capturing 20 to 40,000 crashes every single month. So it gives them information about the global risk that they couldn't otherwise see if they relied only on their customer pool. So I think some of the, you know, debate we have about, all right, is this high enough quality data to include is trumped by the amount of information that we have that we do deal with some, you know, insufficient information that we need to drop from our models or some information that we don't feel is high quality enough to include. There's still more than enough really high quality information to tell you a lot of meaningful, um, meaningful things about the road. That's great. That's great. Hey, listen, Linnea, yeah. thank you. Carrie Ann, thank you so much. And I uh, can't wait till we actually, you know, have, have you both in our offices for, uh, you know, an actual in-person event or meeting something. Or well, what else? Uh, any, who do we have up next on our show? We, on Thursday of this week, we have Brent and Bobby from Benakiva. Oh, so good. We can Excellent. Oh, Excellent. great. Yeah. Hello, female founders. Go ladies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so anyway, listen, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck. And uh, uh, Carrie Ann, where should, or Linnea, where should uh, people look to find more about your company or your offering? Yeah, I mean, so we have um, our big rebrand uh, website launch will be coming up in the next few weeks. We have a placeholder, placeholder website at ometry.com. And then for our public resource site, that is crashometry.com. And it's it's really cool, really relevant information that we're updating um, as uh, data is available. And I encourage everyone, go check it out and uh, reach out to us as well. Um, you know, we have Carrie Ann's uh, contact information on the website, but please reach out, you know, suggestions or if you have any uh, data information, et cetera, um, encourage, encourage you to reach out. Excellent. Okay, we'll put the links in the in the uh, in the, in the notes. So, all right. Awesome. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, 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 Mama. Mama. Hope you Be well and drive safe. Safely.